65 sub article 4 of the Constitution as well as section 5 of the Judicial Service Act come into play. On that score, it is paramount to briefly look at how the Constitution and the statutes ought to be interpreted. As a starting point, the Constitution itself provides for its own theory of interpretation. That is in Article 20, sub Article 4, and Article 259, sub Article 1. Article 20, sub Article 4, requires courts while interpreting the Bill of Rights to promote the values that underlie an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, equity, and freedom, and the spirit purpose and the objects of the Bill of Rights. Article 259 sub Article 1 commands courts to interpret the Constitution in a manner that promotes its purposes, values, principles, advances, and rule of law. Human rights and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights permit the development of the law and contribute to good governance. In telling the constitution of Kenya as highly transformative, as a highly transformative one, courts have over time developed various methods or canons of interpretation. In the case of David Lee and others as Attorney General, the learned High Court judges dealt with four constitutional interpretive principles, being that the constitution must be interpreted holistically that the Constitution does not favor formalistic approaches to its interpretation and it must not be interpreted as one would a mere statute. The Constitution has provided its own theory of interpretation to protect and preserve its values, objects, and purposes, and that in interpreting the Constitution, non-legal considerations are important to give its true meaning and values. The Supreme Court, in the matter of the Kenya National Commission, on human rights, Supreme Court adversary opinion reference which I've given at paragraph 26 answered the question as to what holistic interpretation of the Constitution means. The court stated as follows. But what is meant by holistic interpretation of the Constitution? It must be, it, it must mean interpreting the Constitution in context. It is contextual analysis of the constitutional provision, reading it alongside and against other provisions, so as to maintain a rational expli explication of what the constitution must be taken to mean in the light of the history of the issues in dispute and of the prevailing circumstances. In the case of Tiny Fuza was an attorney general which I've given, citation I've given, the court was of the firm position that the constitution must be read as an integrated whole. The court observed as follows. The entire constitution has to be read as an integrated whole, and no one particular provision destroying the other, but each sustaining the other. This is the rule of harmony, the rule of completeness and exhaustiveness, and the rule of paramountcy of the written constitution. On the tenet that the Constitution does not favor formalistic approaches to its interpretation and that it must not be interpreted as one would a mere statute, the Supreme Court pronounced itself in the case in re-entering independent electoral commission. The court said as follows, the rules of constitutional interpretation do not favor formalistic or positivistic approaches. The Constitution has incorporated non-legal considerations which we must take into account in exercising our jurisdiction. The Constitution has a most modern Bill of Rights that envisions a human rights-based and social justice-oriented state and society. The values and principles articulated in the preamble in Article 10, in Chapter 6, and in various provisions reflect historical, economic, social, cultural, and political realities and aspirations that are critical in building a robust, patriotic, and indigenous jurisprudence for Kenya. Article 159 sub Article 1 states that judicial authority is derived from the people. That authority must be reflected in the decisions made by the courts. Close quote. In expounding the principle that the Constitution has provided its own theory of interpretation to protect and preserve its values, objects, and purposes, the retired Chief Justice. His Lordship, 
Honorable Mutunga had the following to say in his concurring opinion in the Speaker of the Senate and another versus Attorney General, the Honorable Chief Justice then had this to say. In both my respective dissenting and concurring opinions, in the matter of principle of gender representation in the National Assembly and Senate, I argue that both the Constitution 2010 and the Supreme Court Act 2011 both provide comprehensive interpretive framework <coughs> upon which fundamental groups, pillars, and solid foundations for the interpretation of our Constitution shall be based. In both opinions, I provided the interpretive coordinates that should guide our jurisprudential journey as we identify the core provisions of our Constitution, understand its content, and determine its intended effect. <coughs> he proceeded to say more, which I have included, but I will not read. The Supreme Court also expounded the incorporation of non-legal considerations and their importance in constitutional interpretation. In the case Communications Commission of Kenya and five others versus rural media services, paragraph uh, 56, uh, the court said this, we revisit once again the critical theory of constitutional interpretation and relate it to the emerging human rights jurisprudence based on chapter 4, the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. The fundamental right in question in this case is the freedom and independence of the media. We have taken this opportunity to illustrate how historical, economic, social, cultural, and political content is fundamentally critical in, some, in discerning the various provisions of the Constitution that pronounce on its theory of interpretation. A brief narrative of the historical, economic, social, cultural, and political backgrounds to Articles 4, sub Article 2, Article 33, Article 34, and Article 35 of the Constitution has been given above in paragraphs 145 and 146. We begin with the concurring opinion of the CJ and the President in the Tirao Amunya case, where uh, there was references to Black Law Dictionary, where it was said that references to Black Law Dictionary will not, therefore, always be enough, and references to foreign cases will have to take into account these peculiar Kenyan needs and contexts. It is possible to set out the ingredients of the theory of the interpretation of the Constitution. The theory is derived from the Constitution, Constitution through conceptions that may, that may, that my dissenting and concurring opinions have signaled as examples of interpretive coordinates. I not read the entire quotation. Then, in the case of Center for Human Center for Rights education and awareness and another the court of appeal also dealt with the subject of constitutional interpretation and laid out the very principles discussed above. The court further recounted the nexus between the principles of constitutional interpretation and the principle of statutory interpretation in the following manner. The principles on constitutional interpretation are not new. They also apply to the construction of statutes. There are other important principles which apply to the constructions of statutes, which, in my view, also apply to the construction of a constitution, such as presumption against absurdity, meaning that a court should avoid a construction that produces an absurd result, the presumption against unworkable or impracticable result, meaning that a court should find against a construction which produces unworkable or impracticable result. Presumption against an a non, a non malas or illogical result, meaning that the court should find against a construction that creates an anomaly or otherwise produces an irrational or illogical result, and the presumption against artificial result, meaning that the court should find against a construction that produces artificial result, and lastly, the principle that the law should serve public interest meaning that the court should strive to avoid adopting a construction which is in any way adverse to public interest, economic, social, 
and political or otherwise. The court, as an independent arbiter of the Constitution, has fidelity to the Constitution and has to be guided by the letter and spirit of the Constitution. On our part, we wish to emphasize that the Constitution directs that it shall be interpreted in line with the doctrine of living constitutionalism. The doctrine holds that a Constitution is a living document meant to evolve over time to reflect societal changes, contemporary realities, and shifting values. It further recognizes that the law is dynamic and adaptive, adaptable to evolving circumstances, often encapsulated in the maxim that, in quote, the law is always speaking. It, it underscores the constitutional provisions as not static or frozen in time, but must be understood as applying to current circumstances regardless of their original context. This interpretive approach ensures that the constitution remains relevant and effective in guiding the governance and legal framework of a modern, dynamic society. Moreover, the doctrine that the law is always speaking aligns with the purposive approach to constitutional interpretation as endorsed by courts in various jurisdictions. Under this approach, courts are required to interpret constitutional provisions in a way that gives effect to their underlying purpose and objectives rather than adhering to a rigid or literal reading. Further, courts have emphasized the need for a flexible and forward-looking interpretation of the Constitution to meet the needs of a modern state. With the above interpretive principles in mind, we will now deal with other issues posed in the application under consideration. I will deal with the second issue on whether the DCJ can assign judges pursuant to Article 165, sub Article 4 of the Constitution. There is no doubt that this was the most contested issue in the subject application. Article 165, sub Article 3, and sub Article 4 of the Constitution provide for empanelment of benches of an even number of judges as follows. Permit me not to go through that. Uh, in dealing with the above issue, courts have taken two diametrically opposite positions. One of them being that the assignment of judges is a constitutional duty which can only be undertaken by the Honorable Chief Justice. As such, the Honorable DCJ cannot assign judges under Article 165, sub Article 4 of the Constitution. The other position posits that although the duty to assign judges is provided for in the Constitution, its implementation is administrative and that duty can be undertaken by the Honorable DCJ. In Kenya Medical Research Institute versus AG, which was a three-judge bench of this court, held as follows, the court, paragraph 37. Therefore, by ex uh, empaneling this bench, the chief justice was carrying out his constitutional mandate as opposed to similar functions under the former constitution, which were changed on the constitutional provisions and were merely administrative, end of quote. In Lena, Conchella, and others, which was a five bench, five judge bench for this court. The court went ahead and described the role of the Chief Justice under Article 165.4 as constitutional as, as opposed to a merely administrative uh, function. It uh, also said, it is our view that a constitutional mandate of the CJ can be judicial administrative or political and the current constitution does not indeed state that the chief justice is the head of the judiciary which embodies all these functions the learned judges in that empanel bench then found that the constitutional mandate exercised by the cj under 165.4 of the constitution is an administrative function the court also elaborately dealt with the issue as to whether 
such an administrative function could be undertaken by the Honorable DCJ, and in the end, the court rendered itself as follows. I quote, uh, paragraph 78, uh, it therefore our finding that constitutional function of the CJ to assign benches under Article 1654 being an administrative function can be performed by the uh, Deputy Chief Justice when the Chief Justice is for good reason and unable to perform. End of quote. The petitioners in these matters also cited the decision in Okoiti versus JSC and another, which is constitutional petition number A408 of 2020, as addressing the position that the assignment of judges is a constitutional mandate and the sole preserve of the Honorable the Chief Justice. The decision was delivered by yours truly, who is part of this expanded bench. We have carefully considered the same decision. One of the issues therein, which may be said to have a bearing on this matter, was whether the Honorable CJ could rely on Section 5, Subsection 4, and Subsection 5 of the Judicial Service Act to authorize the Honorable DCJ to serve as the acting Chief Justice when the Chief Justice was proceeding on leave pending retirement until when a succeeding Chief Justice was appointed. As the matter did not deal with the integrities of the aspect of assigning of judges, but rather the constitutionality of the actions of the CJ who was exiting service, we respectively find that the issue is not at par with what is under consideration in this instant application. The same decision is hence distinguishable. Returning to the matter at hand, it is imperative to look at uh, the various terms uh, which come to play in this matter, including the administrative <coughs> actions as well as uh, judicial actions. I, we have uh, uh, gone through that. I do not uh, think there is need for me to read all that. It's in the ruling. And I proceed to, uh, to state that from the above discourse, we do not find any difficulty in affirming the position that a constitutional mandate of the Honorable Chief Justice can be judicial, administrative, or political. We further find and hold uh, that the constitutional mandate exercised by the Honorable Chief Justice under Article 165, sub-Article 4 of the Constitution, is a constitutionally administrative function. We shall now consider whether the function of the Honorable Chief Justice under 165, sub Article 4 of the Constitution, can be performed by the Honorable DCJ. Article 161 of the Constitution establishes the office of the Chief Justice as the head of judiciary, and that of the Deputy Chief Justice as the Deputy Head of the Judiciary. Article 163 of the Constitution creates the Supreme Court and designates the Honorable Chief Justice as the President of the Court. The deputy chief justice is the deputy is to deputy the chief justice and is also the vice president of the court. Article 171 of the constitution establishes the Judicial Service Commission or the JC as one of the chapter 15 commissions. The honorable chief justice in JC is the chairperson and in this scenario and unlike the constitutional architecture in Articles 161 and 163, the Honorable DCJ is not the vice chairperson of JSC. <clears throat> Running alongside the foregoing are the functions of the Chief Justice and the Honorable DCJ as provided for in Section 5 of the Judicial Service Act. The provisional states as follows. This is in respect to administration of the judiciary. I do not need to uh, before all that, I proceed to uh, to say that uh, the decision in Lena uh, Conchella also dealt with the definitions and uh, various types of deputies and ultimately rendered itself uh, in the following manner. Uh, I think this one is short, but 
paragraph 77 that it says it has been canvassed before us that where the constitution intends the deputy chief justice to act on behalf of the chief justice it has expressly stated so specific examples cited were articles 141 1 144 these provisions fall under chapter 9 of the constitution that deals with the executive this chapter does not have a general provision as regards the deputization of the Chief Justice by the Deputy Chief Justice as is provided for in Article 161 to be in Chapter 10 of the Constitution on the Judiciary. Hence, the provision of the deputization of the Chief Justice in Chapter number 9, a holistic and purposeful interpretation of Article 161 to be of the Constitution and Section 5 of the Judicial Service Act leads to lead us to the conclusion that the deputy chief justice substitutes the chief justice where necessary end of quote in the end the learned, the learned judges found that uh, found and held that the constitutional function of the honorable uh, chief justice to assign the benches under article 165 for the constitution being that a deputy function can be performed by the dcj when the dcj is for good reason unable to perform this function on our part we have carefully addressed our minds to the issue. We find that there was a deliberate scheme by the, by the drafters of the Constitution for the Honorable DCJ to deputize the Honorable CJ as Deputy Head of the Judiciary and as the Vice President of the Supreme Court, but not in the JSC. Such was an emphasis on the various manifestations of the constitutional duties bestowed upon the Honorable Chief Justice and the Honorable DCJ. As such, the prevailing legal position is that the Honorable DCJ can deputize the Honorable CJ in discharging judicial functions and in the administration of the judiciary as an arm of government, but cannot do so in respect of the affairs of the JSC. Our attention has also been drawn to the provisions of Article 259, sub Article 3b of the Constitution, which states uh, as follows. This uh, refers to construing the Constitution, and sub Article 3 provides as follows Every provision of this Constitution shall be construed according to the doctrine of interpretation that the law is always speaking, and therefore, among other things, be. Any reference in this constitution to a state or other public or public office or officer or a person holding such an office includes a reference to the person acting in or otherwise performing the functions of the office at any particular time. Emphasis or otherwise performing the functions of the office at any particular time. The above provision creates three tiers in which constitutional functions can be exercised. That is, by the substantive office holder, or by a person in an acting capacity, or by a person otherwise performing the functions of the office at any particular time. In our understanding, and against the background of the doctrine as stated, the drafters of our constitution were deliberate about ensuring that the administration of duties and the application of the constitutional provisions are continuous and seamless, recognizing the necessity for offices and their functions to be performed, even in transitional or extraordinary circumstances. Such an interpretation avoids technicalities and vacuums that could disturb the functioning of state offices of public institutions, thereby promoting administrative efficiency and upholding the principles of constitutional governance. The provision reflects the broader principles of the rule of law and good governance, which require that state and public offices continue to function effectively, even during periods of transition or when the substantive office holder is unavailable. It in turn promotes legal certainty and administrative efficiency by ensuring that all constitutional responsibilities are carried out without disruption. For this reason, the functions of Article 165, sub Article 4, in our view, and in as far as the same relate to the office of the Chief Justice, 
also includes the Deputy Chief Justice acting in the capacity of the Office of the Chief Justice or discharging its functions in an interim acting or auxiliary law. At this point in time, we also wish to point out that the Honorable Chief Justice empaneled this very bench on the 14th day of October 2024 to deal with six constitutional petitions that inter alia challenged the first petitioner's impeachment process in the National Assembly. The same petitions are still current. On the 18th of October 2024, the Honorable DCJ empaneled the same bench to deal with constitutional petitions challenging the impeachment of the first petitioner in the Senate. To us, it is beyond far adventure that the Honorable DCJ can assign judges under Article 165 of Article 4 of the Constitution whenever he or she is discharging any of the constitutional functions on behalf of the Chief Justice. In this case, we do not find any fault in the Honorable DCJ assigning judges to sit in this bench, more so when the Honorable Chief Justice has not raised any red flag. We'll deal with a question of other related issues that came up during the submissions of the application. Besides the issue of the benches and panelment by the deputy CJ, several additional issues have been raised. The bench found it necessary to address these issues so that so as to ensure both the completeness of the record and finality in the issues raised. During the submissions, an issue was raised concerning the directions issued by the three-judge bench and the transmission of the files in Nairobi Petition E565 of 2024, Kerogoya Petitions E013 and E014 Consolidated, as well as E015 of 2024. A review of the CTS, that is the case tracking system, confirms that the petition in E565 of 2024 was filed on the 18th of October 2024 at 8 o'clock p.m. Later that same day, approximately five hours on at 1.51 p.m., Justice Chacha Muita dealt with an application filed under certificate of urgency which had been submitted alongside the petition. By 5.33 p.m., roughly three hours after the other application, a notice of motion application dated the 1st of October 2024, was dated the 1st of October 2024, was filed. This time by the respondents, seeking the following orders. One, that the application be certified as urgent and service of the application dispensed with in the first instance. Two, that pending the hearing and determination of that application, inter partes, this honorable court it is to set aside, bury, or review the orders issued on the 18th day of October 2024, that is the interim conservatory orders. Three, that in the alternative, this court be pleased to set aside, bury, or discharge the ex parte orders issued on the 18th day of October 2024, and four, that this honorable court to issue any other orders it deems fit in the interest of justice. Following its empanelment on the 18th of October 2024, and having received directions from the office of the deputy CJ, the bench deliberated on the appropriate directions to be issued. On the 19th of October 2024, at 12.20 p.m., the bench issued the following directions. That in light of the urgency of the matter and the weighty issues raised therein, we direct that the application be served and responded to forthwith for hearing interpartes on Tuesday, the 22nd of October, 2024, at 11 a.m. in open court number 18. Petition E013, on the other hand, was filed on the 25th of September, 2024, at 8.33 p.m. While petition E014 was filed on the 2nd of October, 2024, at 7.07 
p.m. Both way past the usual working hours of the courts. The CTS will further show that an application in E014 was filed on the 30th of September 2024 and directions were issued on the very same day without a matter of uncertified and urgent. Subsequent directions and a ruling issued on the 11th of October 2024 resulted in the consol consolidation of petitions E013 and E014 followed by an order for an annulment. As the record on CTS will further show, the directions issued by the court in E014 of 2024, which were issued on the 2nd of October 2024, were again issued at 6.22 p.m., which is outside of what one would call the routine working hours of the court. This was due to the urgency demonstrated in the application, which sought directions regarding the then ongoing public participation process. The bench takes great exception to the petitioner applicant's conduct that when favorable to them, issues of orders, or rather orders issued outside of what one would refer to as the normal working hours of the court raise no concern. However, when the court acts in an instance where it has been moved by any other party and likewise proceeds to deal with an application at hand, the applicants show their indignation. Moving to petition E015, <coughs> the CTS again would show that the same was filed on the 18th of October 2024, and once again following the directions issued by the court, this bench was empaneled on the 18th of October 2024 to hear all the three petitions, that is E565 of 2024, E013, E014, and E015, all of 2024. From this sequence of events, it is notable that the interaction between counsel and the courts on an almost real-time basis is not novel and is in fact a practice that councils are well familiar with. The CTS enables both counsel and the court to operate in real time, transcending traditional time limitations. This fact also betrays the argument that with the advent of the CTS system, it is not unusual for courts to issue directions within the filing of an application or outside of what once again would be referred to outside the routine work hours of the court when circumstances do so require. Moreover, in raising the issue of improper seating, <coughs> the applicants omitted a crucial fact which was that the court had been moved by the respondents in petitions E565 of 2024 and E015 of 2024. As such, the court did not convey small motive, but rather in response to the applications for it. The applicants have repeatedly referred to this convening as a sitting of the court, a term that we feel at the bench requires clarification and demystification. It is a matter of judicial notice that since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the introduction of the case tracking system, the tradition of dealing with certificates of urgency has been evolved. Allow me to quote the practice direction number 19A of the High Court Practice Directions of the 11th of January 2022, which states as follows, that applications filed under certificate of urgency shall be considered by the judge, we emphasize here, at the earliest opportunity. 
while the practice directions also stipulated that applications filed after 12 p.m. may be considered the next working day, the full adoption of the e-filing system across the judiciary has likely rendered these provisions obsolete. Applications are now processed almost in real time, a fact well known to the justice users across the country and which we have demonstrated in this room. <coughs> Furthermore, practice direction 19B confers discretion upon the court to issue orders or directions without the attendance of advocates or parties. This implies that the court can indeed issue directions on an application without the need for a formal seating. The relevant provision, once again, reads as follows that the court may, in its discretion, issue orders, stroke directions without the attendance of the advocates or parties. In this court, or rather in this case, the issue has been raised that this court allegedly served and considered an application by the respondent on a Saturday outside of the official court hours. The ordinary definition of a city, as provided in the Black's Law Dictionary, is a formal occasion when the court convenes to conduct its business. In this instance, no such formal seating occurred. In this instance, I repeat, no such formal seating occurred. Rather, the bench merely conferred and issued directions electronically as expressly permitted under practice directions 19B. This, markedly different, this is markedly different from a court session in which the bench is convened to hear and determine a matter. Furthermore, no evidence or proceedings have been presented before this bench to support the claim that a formal sitting did take place. Accordingly, it is only fair and reasonable for the parties to dispel any notion that this bench convened to hear arguments from any party ex parte before issuing directions. No such formal sitting took place, the court again emphasizes, and directions were issued electronically in line with established practice and procedural rules. We do, however, recommend that the current practice directions and relevant statutes such as the High Court Organization and Administration Act be amended so as to provide a much needed clarity on this subject. Moreover, for the avoidance of doubt, and out of all the prayers sought by the respondent, only prayer number one, which sought to have the matter certified as urgent, was granted. <coughs> No other reliefs were considered or granted at the time. It is evident that the court was fully cognizant of both the urgency of the matter and the potential repercussions that, grant, that granting any further ex parte orders could have had on the prevailing status quo. With this understanding, and in an effort to balance the scales of justice, the bench issued the directions that are now being charged. We hold the view that there was nothing unconventional in the manner in which this bench dealt with the two applications filed under certificate of urgency. As regards the arguments that directions have already been issued by the respective court for a mention before the bench on the 24th of October 2024, the arguments by the applicants appear to insinuate that the bench ought to have retained the date. For clarity purposes, this date had not been given by this bench, rather this date had been given prior to the empanelment of this bench. However, upon empanelment of the bench, the applications under certificates of urgency, the ones that I have just referred to, were filed, which applications were dealt with, and we feel rightly so. Being seized of the matter, it is our view that the bench retains the discretion to issue appropriate directions, depending on the developments and in light 
use of its mandate as it did, having been moved by a party and a certificate of urgency. With respect to the, uh, to the claim that was raised on discriminatory transmission of files to the bench, it must be emphasized that this bench has no role and no control whatsoever in the administrative processes that occur prior to its empowerment. Concerns have been raised about delays in the transmission of certain files, but it is crucial for us to clarify that the term transmission in this case may not necessarily refer to the physical transfer of documents. In the context of judicial processes, particularly with the advent of digital systems, transmission may very well refer to the electronic movement or assignment of case files within the judiciary's digital infrastructure. We say this on the strength of the fact that with the CTS, all files documents are available in real time across the judiciary, eliminating the need for physical file movements. Let me refer once again to practice direction number 41 in Roman 2, which provides that advocates and litigants shall have access to court information electronically. While this court cannot and will not speculate on the causes of any delays in file transmission, the bench nonetheless finds no basis for concluding that such delays amount to any form of procedural omission on the part of the bench, as no such evidence has been presented. Applicants have equally in their submissions attempted to cast aspersions on the proceedings of this court, some of which as I have already referenced, that is that the court was convened on Saturday, stating that there is no urgency in this matter, and so there was no need to convene the sittings of the 22nd day of October 2024, that this matter is being given priority over other petitions which have been filed, an insinuation that the bench is part of a conspiracy to infringe the petitioner's Article 50 right to fair hearing, and what I have again alluded to that the transmission of the files from the Kilomoya High Court took place with what has been referred to as a supersonic speed. One of the counsels uh, went further by, intimidate, uh, by intimating that an exercise keen to the radical surgery may well be forthcoming, a statement which the bench, with tremendous respect, perceives as a veiled attempt at intimidation. The bench feels that such remarks are regrettable and wholly inappropriate. This bench remains firm in its duty will not be swayed or influenced by any form of intimidation, regardless of its source. The bench takes the view that the applicants appear to selectively focus on aspects that favor their position more conveniently disregarding that the clients that the applicants are presently benefiting from final conservative orders, which this bench did not deem it fit to lift. Um, <coughs> despite having obtained final conservatory orders, as the court has uh, already observed, it is now apparent that the applicants no longer perceive the urgency in this matter. Instead, they seek to cast aspersions on this court for addressing the matter with the necessary expedition. Such conduct is contradictory and undermines the very urgency that the applicants had initially invoked. The bench notes that the issues raised in this petition have, in these petitions rather, have on various occasions and before different judges consistently been certified as urgent and as involving substantive constitutional questions. This underscores the gravity and significance of the matters at hand. One of the counsels
Rose again, insinuated that this bench is part of a conspiracy to violate the petitioner's right to a fair hearing under Article 50 of the Constitution. The bench finds that these submissions are without any foundation and wholly without merit. This court has not issued any rulings or directions that would suggest such an assertion. It is apparent that this argument was made for the sake of the gallery and we find it unnecessary to therefore address it further, save to reaffirm, save to reaffirm that this court remains fully committed to upholding the Constitution and the rule of law. In conclusion, we do find and hold that the accusations made by the applicants against this bench are entirely without merit. Obviously, the last part of the meeting is whether the matter raises issues of public interest which require expedition, disposition of the petitions. The applicants have urged that the applications before the court are not urgent and have loudly wondered why it was necessary to give directions for hearing of the applications on the 22nd day of October, 2024. In response, the bench quotes Article 131, which establishes the Office of the President and the Office of the Deputy President, and also we have cited Article 147, um, which regards to the functions of the Deputy President, just to lay context. And the context is this, according to the bench, that the first petitioner has been impeached under Article 145 of the Constitution, marking the first instance of such an event in Kenya's history. The impeachment of the said petitioner has undoubtedly garnered significant public interest, and these court proceedings represent a direct challenge to that impeachment. It goes without saying that these legal proceedings are of paramount concern to the citizens of this country. To suggest, as the applicants have, that this matter lacks urgency and does not warrant prompt adjudication is disingenuous and dismissive of its far reaching implications. We have taken the liberty to define um, the term public interest in the uh, Black's Law Dictionary. And you will also find the Supreme Court of Kenya's um, definition of public interest in the case of Steven versus the Rose Court, which permit me not to get into. Safe so to say that from the going, from the foregoing, a matter is of public interest if the holding on law affects a considerable number of people in society, if the holding in law involves government and our government agencies, if a determination of law affects the proper functioning of public institutions of governance or of the court's scope for dispensing redress, and if the holding of law affects the mode of discharge of duty by public officers. These proceedings in our view as the bench raise enormous public interest and it is in the interest of the public that these proceedings are heard and finalized most expeditiously. Therefore, the aspersions cast by the applicants concerning the directions for the hearing of the applications before the courts on the 22nd day of October 2024 in our view lack basis and they are dismissed. This position. Having carefully considered the application, we are satisfied that the prayers sought herein must fail. Nonetheless, as indicated in our ruling, there is a pressing need for a clear passage direction regarding the procedure and the process for handling virtual and online directions and proceedings. We commend the applicants as this application has eliminated the necessity for such guidelines and made the issue more apparent. As such, we hereby direct the Honorable Deputy Registrar of this division to transmit a copy of this ruling to the Honorable Chief Justice. Before we conclude, the bench wishes to once again emphasize its unwavering commitment to objective neutrality in this matter. 
they assure all parties that their right to a fair hearing remains fully safeguarded. The bench acting in fidelity to its oath of office 